Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Growing Wisconsin Readers Fall Webinar Series. Today's presentation is on responsive programming, the second presentation in our series. I will be your webinar facilitator, and my name is Tessa Michelson Schmidt. I work as the Public Library Youth and Special Services Consultant working with Wisconsin Public Libraries here at the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. I'm also the coordinator of Growing Wisconsin Readers, which is our statewide early literacy initiative. For those of you who don't know, not because you're uh, not a familiar librarian, but because we hopefully have some audience members who are joining us from outside of the library world, Growing Wisconsin Readers is a statewide initiative that is rooted in public libraries. And it supports Wisconsin caregivers of young children with information about early literacy. And so if you haven't tapped into your local public library yet, I urge you to do so because we are all doing really great things related to early childhood and especially libraries and literacy. Today's webinar topic is on responsive programming. And what this means is that we have a panel of experienced Wisconsin librarians who have done some thinking and tinkering with how they do programming in their libraries related to children, um, young children and their families. So we're going to hear a bunch of different ideas about what that might mean in terms of responding to local needs and interests. So there's just a couple of ideas on the screen right now, but you'll get a lot more once we get started today. Our presenters come from different areas of the state and coincidentally from two large library systems. We have Monica LaVolle from the River Falls Public Library, and she's in the northwest part of the state in the Indian Head Federated Library System. We also have Ashley Team Many, who joins us from the Kakana Public Library and the Outagamie Wapaka Library System. We also have Christy Runquist from the Pepin Public Library, also an Indian head, right on the border of Minnesota and Wisconsin. And we also have Tanya Missilt from the Appleton Public Library, also in the Owls or Outagamie Wapaka Library System. So I want to thank these panelists for coming on board to share their information on this topic with you all today. They have a lot of great ideas, which is why I'm going to turn it over to them. So with that, we're going to have our first presenter, Monica LaVolle. Okay. Monica, can, can you guys hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, just as an introduction, in case you're not quite familiar, um, you can see on your screen, uh, River Falls, Wisconsin, uh, Tessa said way in the northwest corner, um, we're actually a suburb of the Twin Cities. Um, so I'm right over the border in Wisconsin, way up over here. Pretty good sized town um, for this part of the state, which is about uh, 15,000 people. Um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of responsive programming and some family outreach story times. I will touch on a couple of other responsive things that I've done, but I'm primarily focusing on the family outreach story times today. Um, and I thought about what does it mean to be responsive? Um, and how is this responsive? Um, one thing that we saw with our regular story times is that we had families that weren't coming either because uh, parents worked and couldn't come during the day, or we had community members that really weren't using the library, weren't aware of the library, or perhaps um, had obstacles to even coming into the library. Um, we also, kind of on a district, or um, on a different note, the school district, um, with all of the testing and everything happening, are seeing that we don't have kids adequately prepared when they're starting the four-year-old kindergarten or um, regular kindergarten. Uh, with all of those early literacy skills. And so what can we do? Well, we can add early literacy story times to kind of the bulk of what we do and make sure we touch on that parent education, um, but not necessarily during the daytime or not necessarily the way that we'd always been doing it. Um, and I'm a one-person department. Um, I think I saw some other people in the comments saying, you know, I do it all, birth through um, age 18. I do the teen. I do the early literacy. 
Um, so for me, that meant collaborating. It meant collaborating with community organizations, um, not only to increase the effectiveness, but also there's only so much one person can do. And this is where reaching out to community partners has enabled me to be able to make some of these um, responsive programs happen. Um, and that's been awesome. Um, this is me <laughs> right there. Um, the kids call me Miss Monica, and that's one of our family outreach story times. Um, we started with them once a month in the evenings. Um, ironically, I actually have one tonight. Uh, so they're on the third Tuesday of the month. Um, and that's been nice for parents and families uh, who are working during the day are not able to come. And you can see in that picture there, we get a whole range of ages and people. Um, so as I mentioned before, um, community collaboration was crucial. Um, it's just not something I can do single-handedly. Um, one of the things with this Growing Wisconsin Readers initiative is that, you know, partnerships have been um, sort of a focus for a lot of people. And I had put it out there that I was interested in early literacy and partnering with community organizations. And so people were talking about it. And somebody gave my name to um, this Jumpstart to Literacy. Now, Jumpstart to Literacy is a local organization that is here in River Falls. And I'm sure there are similar organizations in various places in the state. Um, but what happened was someone had mentioned my name to the president of this organization. And we ended up sitting down and having a meeting and he is interested in getting early literacy materials out to kids. And I was interested in getting the early literacy education out to parents. And so sort of together, these family story times were born. Um, he predominantly uses WIC, uh, the Women, Infants, and Children. Um, he is currently working through the Pierce County. Um, we are a town that straddles two counties. So we are in Pierce and St. Croix County. Um, and working to get into St. Croix County at the moment. But right now we're in Pierce. Um, and that's actually important to getting the uh, people to know about the story times and to come. Uh, because he goes to the WIC office as part of Jumpstart to Literacy. And he actually invites all of the WIC families individually. He meets them there. He talks about books. He has books available at the WIC offices. And then he invites them to the library. Um, he even goes so far as to call them. He gets their information, and he reminds them, hey, the library is having the story time. Do you want to come? Um, which is awesome. And that's how we have been getting really great turnout. Um, additionally, in River Falls, we have a university campus. So that UWRF, um, that's the University of Wisconsin River Falls. And again, thinking to myself, I can't possibly add more story times to my schedule. How am I going to? get all of this done, I reached out to the university um, education department and found out that they have two um, sort of school clubs, um, students that outside of their regular class time are interested in learning and training about literacy, classroom management, um, and things um, that will help them as they become teachers. Um, and I thought, hey, I can do that. And so I went to a couple of their meetings, and I did some early literacy training. And then I actually um, partner with students. I have uh, two to three students that come and help me do these story times. Um, so they can step in and take some of this. Um, they can practice reading out loud. Um, and I can also give them tips and tricks. Um, I generally write all of the story time plans myself, um, but they've gotten really great um, at kind of taking that and moving forward. Um, and we started this last, I believe, March. And um, it went so well that there were community members through the library and through Jumpstart to Literacy that asked, hey, can we be trained to do story times? Um, and so now I have trained um, just you know some retired teachers, um, and school administrators, people who come and regular, uh, regularly use the library to help us out at this story time. Um, and additionally, going forward, I'm looking at the high school as well. Our high school in town has a child development class. 
and I'm already in talks with the teacher there to see if they're interested in partnering and learning to participate and help us out to make it a little easier for everybody to share sort of this early literacy message. Um, and so far I have found that everyone I have reached out to and for a partner has been um, extremely receptive, um, enthusiastic, and downright excited to get uh, to participate in something like this. Um, this is Cheyenne, and I just love this picture so much. Um, during our uh, family story nights, we have a healthy snack always available. And you can see Cheyenne sitting there with her um, broccoli and peppers, and I believe that is a cookie as well. Um, Cheyenne is also um, one of the kids that prior to these family outreach um, story hours was not a regular library patron. I had never seen her come into the kids' area. Um, she and her mom, Katie, have been so excited about this program. They have now come every month, and I have started to see them coming in and using the library on a regular basis, which is kind of awesome. Um, some of the components, and I talked a little bit about the phone calls to the WIC families. Um, there are members of the Jumpstart to Literacy Board, the President, and some others who made personal phone calls, who invited families, who said, please come and do this. Um, we also have made posters, which we have posted on social media. We have sent out to our pre-K and RF4C, which is um, River Falls for Children, which is the name of the four-year-old kindergarten program here in our town. Um, it was key that we did it on an easy, evening time regularly held. Um, right now we're only at once a month, but I'd really actually like to see that increase because people um, people are really excited about that. Um, we try very hard to put early literacy education into everything we're doing with asides and things that I can teach the parents. Um, we incorporate lots of elements of early literacy using a wide variety of books, felt boards, songs, shakers, movement dances, finger plays, um, pretty much all kinds of things that you can incorporate. Um, and Jumpstart to Literacy provides a free book to every child age five and under that comes. And he was able to get a grant to support that, um, but I also could have supplied free books through donations that we get to the library um, because we are always taking those in. Um, that has been really key, having something that we give them. Um, I often provide an activity as well as the book in the end. And you can see in the picture, um, that's Lily. And that is her clapping with glee over her free princess book that was a very inexpensive scholastic princess book there. Um, and I wanted to briefly, briefly touch, um, in addition to the story times, there's a couple of things that we have got going on that we are doing to respond to in our community. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but I thought it might be fun um, to spark some ideas um, for things that you could do. This, um, this picture here is showing Poolside Book Break, which is an activity we started for the first time this summer. Um, we have a local pool in our community. and you know, it's open all summer. The kids are out there. And we um, collaborated with our park and rec department and said, you know, what if in the afternoon when the lifeguard blows the whistle and makes all the kids get out of the pool and they're sitting around with nothing to do, what if, what if we were there? What if the library was there with stories and books to check out? Um, and we decided, yeah, we wanted to make that happen. And we got a mobile hotspot. So we were able to take our checkout program. Um, we used Sierra. Uh, worked just fine on a laptop using a mobile hotspot right at the pool. We created a small collection of books that we took in totes out there, um, mostly uh, easy to read superhero books, popular chapter series like I Survived and The Never Girls. And we went out there with stories. Um, we went two days a week, and we were out there for about 45 minutes at a time. Um, and you can see there were kids everywhere. There were parents. Um, they loved it. We are going to increase that this summer. We're not only going to be at the pool, but we're going to take that same program to the farmer's market. Um, and we're pretty excited about that. Um, 
I also um, thought that it fit as a responsive program that our um, our school district has a one-to-one -one device program for 7th through 10th graders. And I thought, hey, let's get the library involved in that. So I created um, instructions and a presentation on how to use the Wisconsin Digital Library and download books and materials for the kids. And I actually went into the middle school and was able to present to numerous middle school students um, as a way to use these devices um, and have received great feedback on that. I had, uh, the week after that presentation, I had about 15 seventh graders standing around my desk um, asking for clarification and getting themselves um, various books and things through that, uh, which has been pretty excited uh, or exciting for us um, and was a great way to not only work with the schools, but make sure that the library is remaining relevant um, in all the changes happening in schools. Um, additionally, we're trying to carry forward that early literacy and parent education. So I've been going out to Moms and Dads group and the Family Resource Center um, and WestCap early literacy. Um, I actually went out, drove out to speak to them. They are an organization that works with at-need and at-risk families. And I spoke to the caregivers, kind of doing a similar thing that um, that literacy training that I had done with the university students. Um, I just tailored it a little for these um, caregivers. And they, they work with the parents, and they work on uh, all kinds of sort of other needs that they have, and it was easy to throw in some literacy. Um, and they were they were pretty excited about that. And Jumpstart to Literacy is going to allow them to bring some books through that as well. So um, we've been trying very hard to work with as many organizations and respond to as much community need to get that literacy element up. Um, and it's pretty exciting what we've seen. Um, here is uh, me at Poolside Book Break, um, again, you can see parents on the outside of the fence there, standing and looking around. Um, in addition to being a great way to occupy kids, I would say that this Poolside Book Break was a phenomenal way for people who are not, they're not library users, but not because they have anything against the library, it's just not on their radar. Um, you're going to find those people out at places like the pool and the farmer's market. And we would get approached nearly every time we were out there by parents or grandparents or just community members who would say, hey, are you guys lifeguards? Where are you from? Um, which was a great opportunity to say, we're from the library. Let us tell you about what we have to offer. And we always brought with us applications for library cards. Um, and you can see also in this picture uh, the laptop that I is set up on the table behind me and the, the bins, you can see a pink bin right behind me and a yellow bin on the table. We had four bins full of books uh, and plastic bags to put them in so they wouldn't get wet at the pool um, that kids could come and check out right there at the library um, at the pool. So we had a mini library at the pool. It was awesome. Uh, and that is kind of what I've got for now. This is my contact information, and you are more than welcome to let me know if you have questions or want further clarification on any of it. Thank you so much, Monica. I mean, I just wrote down so many ideas from your presentation, whether it's working with um, working with WIC or university students or high school students, and then getting outside of the library and, and I mean to the pool, that's that's the easy thing to think about doing in the summer. So thanks so much for your ideas and your great slides. And certainly audience members, be in touch with Monica if you want to know more. But hold on because we've got more ideas to share with you. And next up is Ashley T. Menning from the Kokana Public Library in the OWL library system. So Ashley, are you there? Ashley, if you are using your computer audio again, you might need to press the talk button and uh, or unmute what you had um, done before for audio, and hopefully we'll be able to hear you. Okay, Ashley, um, we'll give you another minute here. It keeps going in and out. We understand. <laughs> we had you on before we got started today, so I. Um, understand the frustration. So Ashley, why don't you just let me know if you um, 
want a minute or if you want us to jump ahead to our next panelist and then come back to you. Hello? Hello. Is that Ashley? So it's Amy. Oh. Well, hi, Amy. <laughs> we're, we're, uh, if you want to just mute yourself, we're uh, waiting for Ashley. So, um, okay, uh, Ashley's telling us to go ahead, which is just fine. I'm going to move us ahead to our next presenter here. So, just one moment. Okay, thank you. Microphone, you hit that button and the light comes on. Is that you, Ashley? Are you ready now? Okay, thanks everybody for being patient. Um, Christy, let's hope that you're ready to go. We'll come back to Ashley when she's done. But Christy, we also had you on the line. Okay, before, give it, I'll give it a back. try. Uh, we can, I can okay. hear you just fine, so go right ahead. I am Christy Rundquist, and I am the director at the Pepin Public Library. We too are in the Indian Head Federated Library System. We are the southernmost library in the system and one of only two counties in Pepin County, two libraries in Pepin County. I've been at Pepin for 17 years and I do all of the programming along with everything else, circulation, cataloging, tech support, computer troubleshooting. So I'm kind of the wear all of the hats. We've been doing LAPSIT for the last three years. Each year we have done between four to eight sessions, usually in the spring when families are anxious to get out of the house. It's fun to see the children enter into the activities after a couple of sessions. They always seem so shy and hesitant the first week, but by the third or fourth week they understand the routine and are more likely to participate. So we try to keep the same routine throughout the, each session. This year we enhanced our story time with several items such as an area rug, a parachute, books for choral reading, and supplies to start a thousand books before kindergarten program. We participated in an LSTA grant written by Leah Langby at the Indian Head System, which provided funds for the rug, parachute, and choral reading books. The rug is used for the dancing and music time. We use it as a seating area also. It acts as a focal point for the dancing and the singing to the music. Each week we will use um, a different song, and we use different CDs throughout the sessions, including Baby Loves Jazz, and a couple different Jim Gill CDs. I also use this rug for story time for the three to five year olds. The Lapsit story time focuses on children three years and younger. So when I use it for the three to five year olds, we also have another music CD that includes a song called Walking to the ABCs. And this is from the New Bridge Learning Program. And I found my copy, but I haven't been able to find another copy. I think it might be out of print or out of um, circulation. But if you do look on WorldCat, you can find it on there as part of the, their whole set. So we do lots of new things and fun activities with our new parachute. We usually start by slowly shaking the parachute and then transition to gently raising and lowering the parachute. And then by the time we've done that a few times, one of the kids will usually, without any encouragement or suggestion, go take off and run underneath. So then we'll roll, uh, lower it and try and capture them and we'll let them do that for a little bit. We'll then lower the parachute to put balls and let the children move the parachute to roll the balls around. Or we'll do the two little monkeys jumping on the bed finger play with two stuffed animals that I have. We'll then again raise and lower the parachute again at the end and have them release the handles on and up so that I can step under it and then grab it and roll it up and put it away. And this was very good for uh, cooperative play and for the kids to understand that they can manipulate things all over the place on a big parachute. And these are the books we use for choral reading. With some of the money we received from the LSTA grant, we purchased 12 board book copies of each of these titles. We have in the past borrowed the different kits of board books from the Indian Head System to use for the story time. This had drawbacks as we had to really pre-plan when to request the kits, figure in the courier time, and then have them come and arrive in time for story time. 
Sometimes we were not able to keep the kits for the entire possibly eight sessions, and we'd have to return them so someone else could use them. Now we have enough for every child and parent. We haven't had more than 12 children or adults at any story time yet, but we do have lots more than what we had three years ago. I alternate titles because I get tired of the same title each time. So this way the children are familiar with what we are doing, and yet we all have a little bit of variety. Each time when the parents come, if, they are, if it's their first time, I have a folder of information that I put together. This folder of parent resources includes information on the library, our hours, contact information. It ha now has information on our new Thousand Books Before Kindergarten program. We've included the Growing Wisconsin Readers Flyer. And then the rest of it is things to do at home with their child. The handouts are from the Wisconsin Research Institute, and they are dated from 2006. Uh, they are 20 two-sided sheets. One side has hints of things to do, and the other side is activities that again, support the five areas of early literacy. And these, again, we make certain that when it's their first time coming to any of our story times, we make certain that the families get one of these. This is the journal that we're giving to families when they sign up for the 1,000 books before kindergarten. We just this past summer started this program. And the journal that is given to each child to help is to help the family start recording the books that they, are, that they read. They can record approximately 50 titles in this journal. And from there, then, the journal also has other activities and suggestions for reading for families. It does list the Caldecott Medal winners from 1938 to 2009. It also has a couple of lists of librarian recommended favorite books in three different age groups, ages 2 to 4, 4 to 8, and 9 to 12. Once they complete this, they're going to return it back to us, and then we're going to give them another uh, different, different journal that we put together. And then when they return that, we then move them down to small pocket notebooks to continue recording the books until they reach the 1,000. Each time the families complete a journal or notebook, the child then is able to choose a book bag that was um, made by our local Lutheran church. And they get to have a book bag or a book to keep forever. So they get a choice, and we don't care which they do. These are some of the books that would be their forever books that they can choose to take home. We gather donations from area businesses, individuals, and local service groups to purchase these high quality books. So we could provide a book to each child as a reward for each level in the 1,000 books before kindergarten. We also give each a book to each child for attendance at story time. Now, we don't do it for every single session, um, individual session. But again, the first time or maybe the last time that they come for a story time, we would make certain that they get a book to take home. So if they came all four sessions in the month, we would make certain that they at least got one book to take home. And these we call our forever books. And they're giving out at story times that we provide during WIC clinics every quarter. And each quarter, I go over to the WIC clinic, which is held in the municipal building next door to the library. And I provide some story time activities. We do a little dance. We do some reading of books. And then again, at the end, just before the children leave, they get to choose a book to take home. They can choose whatever book they want to take home. I don't care. It's theirs, and it's their choice. So this is, um, again, books that have been suggested, I think, um, through Every Child Ready to Read. They have a nice list there. That is basically what we do here. Um, I didn't think something as simple as a parachute and some board books for choral reading and an area rug would make such a difference. But it really does. Something so simple really has made a big impact on the participation of the children. And the families are so excited to come now. So think simple things, and they can work. 
This is my contact information. You are welcome to call or email if you have any other questions. Also check out our Facebook page and our PepinPublicLibrary.org webpage for more information on our current programming. And that is all I have, Tessa. Okay. Thank you so much, Christy. Um, you know, you did say those are simple things with the, the parachute and the area rug or just making a folder. But, you know, those are the, the things that we people are so hungry for, things that they can easily adapt to their library, whether it's quite small or, or large. And um, again, it's just all about responding to community needs and figuring out how to make community members feel welcome and to consider the library and all that it offers. So thanks for walking us through all of those visuals and also telling us about um, your different book programs um, to, to help get kids having their own books, their forever books. So that's, um, that's wonderful. Um, we are now going to transition to Ashley. And um, I think she should be able to join us on the line now. And um, so if you just give us a minute as we transition there, we should be good to go. So Ashley, I've got your slides ready. And let's see if we've got an audio connection for you. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're here. Keep fresh. We're all good. So take it away, Ashley. All right. So I am from the Outagamie Wapaka Library System from Kakana, which is in the Fox Valley between Appleton and Green Bay. And we have a population of just under 16,000 that we serve. So the reason that we're here today is because we stated that increasing our story time number was increasing um, our attendance. Um, so in 2012, due to staff vacancies, when I came here, um, they were only offering a baby story time for 0 to 2 and a preschool story time for 3 to 5 year olds. Um, they were both on the same day. One had play time and one had a craft after. Um, since they weren't very developmentally target, I did change them. So in 2013, we started um, these five story times. So we had Bright Babies, which was pre walkers, which is a half hour story time and 15 minutes of play time. Then we had Wonderful Ones, which was just for one year olds, which is 30 minutes of story time and play time. Then we had our Terrific Twos, which was two year olds, which again, 30 minutes of story time, 15 minutes of play. Then we bundle our three to five year olds in Story Sprites. And they have a half hour of story time and 15 minutes of craft after. And then we added an all ages tall tales, which is 30 minutes of story time and 15 minutes of play time. So when we added more programs, we added a lot more impact. In 2012, we were seeing about 60 people per week for story time. Adding those extra three story times brought us up to an average of about 138 people a week. So it made a big difference, and we were seeing a lot of new families coming into the library. So our general story time semesters run from September to December, and then again from January to May. And they're usually between 13 and 16 weeks. It depends um, each semester. Um, so with that average increase of about 78 more people per week, um, it added about 1,200 more people in story time each semester, which increased our general story time program statistics by almost you know, 2,500. And that didn't even include our preschool summer programs and additional programs. That's just story time attendance alone. So that's a huge impact for us. And it also makes our board very happy to see our program statistics go up um, so greatly. Um, so in winter spring of 2014, um, we programmed between January and May. And we had about um, almost 1,900 people in attendance through about 85 programs. And those are mostly just preschool specific programs I'm talking about. Um, and this averages out to about 21 people per program. Um, the photo there is of our pre-walker baby program, um, my absolute favorite program to teach. Um, then this fall, because we still don't think we were offering enough programs, there's still a demand for more, we also started offering a monthly Saturday story time. Um, this is great for working families that may be too busy during the week, or maybe they have very active children that have a lot of extracurricular activities. So we do it once a month now at 1030. Um, we'll kind of do that once a month until we can evaluate whether we need more or if it should stay the same at one a month. Um, we're also offering a bilingual English Hmong story time now every other week on Thursdays for a half hour. And again, pending the success of this program, it may just be implemented as, an, as a weekly regular program. We also have additional story times. Um, 
those are the regular programs that I was talking about increasing, but it doesn't reflect the actual special monthly preschool programs or the summer programs that we do as well. Um, almost every month we also partner with our local nature center and offer an evening educational program. And we also do monthly special evening story times with seasonal themes um, so that we can reach um, some of those working families that may not be able to come to our morning story time program. So some of the other responsive programming that we've tackled since 2012, um, previously before I got here, summer reading program uh, didn't start for kids until they were three years old. Um, so we implemented a new program that included birth all the way up to 18 for our, our children's or youth reading programs. Um, in 2013, we also implemented the 1,000 Books Before Kindergarten program. Some other responsive programming we've done. Um, this year we took the YSS Early Literacy Calendar, which we think is fabulous. And so we keep it out at the desk now. And if families complete three activities a week, at the end of the month they can bring their calendar back and they can collect a prize for having done the activities. Um, this is great. It's um, you know, very little work on our staff's part, um, but great for the families to be working on. We don't set deadlines for when they turn in calendar sheets. If they want to turn in January's sheet because they just found it in March, you know, we don't care. Um, in 2014, we also added a fall reading program, and we had that ready for families to take when they finished summer reading program. Um, so basically when they were collecting their last prizes, we could hand them this new fall reading program, um, which will take them through December. It's based on the Read on Wisconsin book selections. Um, so basically we're giving the kids um, a prize per Read on Wisconsin book they read and uh, answer a question for. Um, so staffing and time, a lot of questions that we get from other libraries our size um, is how, how do you manage so many story times um, with such a small department. Um, before, like previously mentioned, I'm a department of one, basically. I have one staff member that is talented enough that I've been able to utilize her for story time. Um, and as I hire new staff people, I kind of look for programming in them and hire them, um, not necessarily intentionally to be programmers, but so that I can utilize them. So it is not just me. Um, I run the children's team and the adult programming department. Um, so I actually run five of the six story times myself, and I have my assistant run um, the three to five year old bundled story time. Um, the story times are run for about 15 minutes, and then um, we usually do the craft or play after. Um, I know a lot of libraries start with different hours, so maybe you don't open at nine, maybe you do, you know open at ten. Um, there's some wiggle room, definitely, to add programs. I like to get two programs in every morning. Um, we program Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings. That way I don't run into issues with anybody taking long weekends for staff in case I wasn't here. Um, so we mostly program in the middle of the week. Um, I generally tell people it's okay to do an 11 o'clock program. A lot of people are afraid that that's going to cut into lunchtime. But generally, if you're going to do a story time for older children, that's a great time because moms are always prepared. They know all about snacks, so 11 o'clock is not scary. And in fact, sometimes when we do 11 o'clock programs, the families stay until 1230. Afternoon programs, of course, though, are always going to be a little more difficult because of nap time. Um, so typically, I have shied away from afternoon programs unless they're going to be for older children or maybe for homeschool families. Budget is also a concern, of course, all the time. Um, so it did not mean increasing cost, though, for us. We already had all the supplies to perform our story time. And if we needed extra craft supplies, we would use our budget line for it. Or frankly, we would ask for donations. We keep a running um, list on our service desk of all of the things that um, we need for craft supplies or for um, general supplies for the library. Um, we also don't offer snacks because there's just too many allergies out there today and we don't want to take any chances. Um, I think it's wonderful if you can, but if you're really, um, if it's the budget's coming down to, you know, what are we going to do with the money and if, if it's very important, um, we tend to shy away from having food then and spending the money on other things that we may need. Um, and smaller libraries sometimes have to get a little more creative with staff to accommodate extra programs and this is where volunteers can come in handy or f simply rearranging staff hours. Um, to have more people there maybe in the mornings so that um, later, you know, when you're not having story time, you may not need as many people on staff. Marketing is huge. This is the way that you make more impact is by making sure people know that they have, you have these programs at your library. So of course, if you have a small local paper, um, our local paper, I write something once a month that I can turn into them and they print whatever I write. Um, they'll write any article that I ask. They'll you know, let me write it and they put it in the paper. Larger city papers are also a good option for you too if you have one um, close to your surrounding area. 
online local event calendars. They're everywhere. Um, find the ones that are you know, hosting uh, community events near you and add yours. Social media is huge. Um, reaching out to families through Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, um, it's one of the best <laughs> methods of getting people into your programs. Um, school distributions are great. Um, our school lets us distribute um, a few times a year. It's a really great way to get everyone in your district. Our local supermarket will also do bag stuffers, which is great. So um, you can talk to someone at your supermarket and see if they'll stuff a flyer in some of the bags at the grocery store. Of course, having paper flyers at your desk is a must-have. Community billboard or bulletin boards around town are also really um, great ways to get your information out there. Word of mouth is also huge. If you have a story time program that you know, you know, you have your regular patrons, they love your program, ask them to tell their friends about it. Word of mouth is huge. When moms find something they like, they want to brag about it. But make sure you tell them you need them to brag about it so that we get more people at story time. And then of course your website has to be easily accessible for people to find the programs that you have. Um, sometimes I, when I look at other libraries' website, it doesn't even say what age story time is for, or it's very difficult to find the programs on the website. So making sure that, that it's easily accessible for people is also really important when it comes to marketing. So here's my contact information. Um, I will be speaking at WLA on uh, developmentally age-appropriate story times. So if you do have any questions about maybe those five story times we do that are very um, age-targeted, uh, if you're at WLA, come check it out. And thank you for all listening today. Thanks so much, Ashley, and uh, thanks for your perseverance with the uh, with the audio. Um, great photos, great ideas. There was a bit of chat happening regarding the early literacy calendar, and I just want to mention to folks that the 2015 calendar is almost ready to be published, and I know that it will be shared by the Youth Services section at WLA. If you won't be there, just watch um, the YSS blog or tune in other ways to find out um, how you can access that calendar because um, it's a great thing to use, whether it's just a resource or the way that Ashley uses it as, as a way of um, supporting families who do the activities. So, Thanks for that response. And also just a reminder, feel free to chat here. This is what webinars are all about. It's, it's getting information, but also checking in with each other. So thanks for the Q&A that's been happening there in the chat and the, the great comments. We're now going to transition to our final presenter, and that's Tanya Misoka at the Appleton Public Library. So Tanya, are you there and ready yes, to so bring us all home? Yes, we can. So it's all yours. Okay. I have my email address on the bottom of the chat screen. So if you would like to contact me afterwards, you can reach me at that email address. Can all of you who are uh, participating let me know if you have any minority populations in your communities that speak a language other than English at home? Okay, while I'm waiting for responses for that, I am the head of children's services at the Appleton Public Library. Um, we have five, we have actually we had five full-time staff when I started. We now have six full-time staff. I do not do programming. Um, I actually do a lot of grant writing. <laughs> and for some of you, what I'm going to present to you may not be as feasible, um, but I wanted to present it to you. It's something uh, similar to what they're doing in Columbus, Ohio. Okay, I see Spanish speakers, Portuguese, Spanish, Hmong, Chinese. So there are some some um, communities out there with some diversity. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. I want to introduce you to Yi Vu. She's um, our Hmong Family Outreach Specialist, and I will tell you what she does and how we came to have her as we move through the program. Um, Yi has a master's degree in library and information science. She's from, uh, originally from Kakana, and we believe that she may be one of the first Hmong uh, people in the country to have a, a library degree. This is Norma Oliveras, who recently joined us. She's our Hispanic Outreach Specialist. She recently joined us in um, May, uh, May or June of this year. And all of uh, these positions were, were uh, we, we were able to get through, through grants initially. 
Okay, so how did it get started? A lot of the grants are based, of course, on, on statistics and what your community needs. And the, the only way really to, to get the additional staff that you need, uh, you really have to start cracking away and picking away at grants as unpleasant as they are. Um, what happened is, I don't know how many of you have a United Way or some type of community study that happens on a regular basis. If any of you want to comment on that, please do. In 2011, we had a United Way Fox Cities Life Study, and everybody in the community, when those, when those life studies are published, everybody uh, who's a mover and a shaker or a stakeholder looks at those life studies to see what's going well in our community, what's not going well in our community. Um, and what happened in that 2011 study was that it showed that the percentage of Fox City's third graders reading at proficiency had declined every year since 2006 and 2007. And already by third grade, a fairly wide achievement gap existed between low-income students and others. It also pointed to the fact that investments at this age and younger right down to uh, through birth will be long-term, uh, will would provide long-term dividends for individual children and for the community as a whole. So there was a there was a financial stake too in improving the the uh, economy in in the community if we invested in children because it costs a lot less to invest in children when they're young rather than try to fix poverty after it already happens. It also identified support for education as an opportunity area. And education was ranked second of 11 priority areas for the community leaders to work on independently or collectively. Oops. So what I, I wanted to do was to break that, that down and try to figure out exactly what all that meant. And um, I learned that if I looked at the third grade students' uh, WKCE score, specifically in Appleton, um, I wanted to look to see who was not proficient. And according to the WKCE scores, there were 36% of our Asian third graders who were not proficient or below proficient. 25% were Hispanic, 38% had limited English proficiency, and 30% were economically disadvantaged. So I could tell by looking at those WKCE scores that we were really talking about a large disadvantaged population. And we also knew that that population had been growing uh, significantly in Appleton and the Valley for uh, you know, maybe the last 10, 15 years, a little longer than that, perhaps. Then I started trying to think of what the Appleton uh, Public Library could do about it. What was our role? And we have a pretty big library. Um, we circulate over 570,000 items uh, from our collection each year. Um, there are 32, well, almost 33,000 adults attending our programs. Now we have almost 30,000 attend just children's programs alone every year. And we have a, about 5,000 children participate in summer reading programs every year. So we knew we had great numbers, but something wasn't jiving. And it, it was clear, you know, we had to think about who we were missing. Um, so clearly we could look around at the population of, of patrons coming into the library, and we knew we weren't, didn't have as many Hispanic people represented in the library as we did in the community, or Hmong people in the community, I mean in the library as we did in the community. And we needed to think about why that was. What, what were we missing? And what could we do about that? And I was pondering on that when uh, we were lucky enough to have Yi Vu uh, come to us from um, UW Madison as a student intern finishing her library degree and she wanted to work with children. So I invited her to start promoting ECRR in home visits. Normally you wouldn't think that the library would have enough money to, to staff home visits because you don't get a lot of bang for your buck that way. But because she was a student intern and we were experimenting, we had her do that. Of course we tried to set up as many safety mechanisms as possible. She was only a uh, going on home visits with another staff member in the beginning. So what we have come to have now is we have uh, moved Yi's internship. It became an LSTA grant funded position for a year, half time. And then once the city um, council was able to look at her statistics and the things that she was able to do, they 
made her position into a half-time city-funded position, and then she was able to take a half-time library assistant position, so she actually works full-time for us. At, after we got Yi on board, I wanted to be able to get a Hispanic outreach specialist on board, and we were able to hire Norma Oliveras on a community foundation grant half-time, and then she also took a half-time library assistant position. So starting very recently, we have two full-time staff who speak different languages. Okay, so we named our new program, we called it Appleton Ready to Read after um, Reach Out and Read. Uh, nope, help me out here, after Every Child Ready to Read. Um, that encourages parents to be their child's first teacher and it focuses on read, write, sing, talk, play. What they do is, um, they ha we have to do some very creative marketing in order to bring these, these diverse populations into our library. So I don't know how many of you really want me to get into that with a limited time, but I'm just going to say that it, it, it does take diverse marketing, and a lot of it is word of mouth. But the first thing that these staff members do is they schedule a home visit, and at the home visit, they focus on reading and writing. They bring a, a book to the family, and they bring uh, crayons and coloring books and things to uh, use as tools to teach the importance of reading and writing at home. Then they schedule a second visit at the library, and the, the families get a tour of the library. They get a library card if they want one. Um, we'll look at any fines that they have. If we can help clear some of those up, we will do that. We show them how to use the self-check. We show them how to choose select age-appropriate books. Uh, we use a lot of wordless picture books with these families, and we also um, encourage use of um, audio books because a lot of the parents are not able to read. Um, the, the families also, we focus on that visit, we focus on talking and singing at home and talk about what that looks like. They also get a free music CD. For the Hmong community, that's pretty important because we learned that in the Hmong community, there is no history of anything called nursery rhymes. And because that wasn't a written language until the 1950s, um, they don't, there's, there isn't a long history of reading on laps or intergenerational experience with literature at all. Um, additionally, they, they didn't have music in the Hmong community that was specifically geared towards children. So we give them a, a music CD that's um, English nursery rhymes, and the uh, Hmong outreach specialist also gives them a, a list of the words in English for what it's worth to the ones that can read. Um, and then the last visit to the library, they come to a specialized program. Um, we have a program called Appleton uh, Ready to Read, Play and Learn Hmong Edition, and Play and Learn Hispanic Edition every Sunday afternoon. Um, oh, I guess I can move through here. We, this is a research-based program, so we actually do complete surveys with this whole thing. And at each, this is the home visit. I'm, uh, in this slide, I'm talking about the importance of of getting through some surveys, some um, pre-literacy skills, assessing pre-literacy skills, things like that. And I've covered this. OK, so after they've done all those three visits, we also refer these families to other, other agencies in our community that um, we know that they can, they can uh, access to get additional help. And these are some pictures from Play and Learn Hmong Edition. At Play and Learn, we are, we've had an, an average attendance of 40 to 50 people at each, at the Hmong class and the Hispanic class. So the, the attendance has been phenomenal. Um, I was mentioning that we do some referrals. This is a key component of this. If we discover families that, um, have, that, that need the children are three to five years old and they need developmental screening. We refer them to the Appleton Area School District, and they, the Appleton Area School District does come here uh, monthly to do developmental screening. So these, some of the families will get screened here at the library to see if they have got any de developmental concerns. And if they do, um, Appleton Area School District tries to find programs that, that may serve them. If we have children who are birthed to three who we think are developmentally behind, we'll refer them to Audi County County Birth to Three Early uh, Childhood Intervention, and they screen them. And if they discover that there's some problems, they will 
offer additional services. We uh, refer adults to the Fox Valley Literacy Council uh, for uh, adult tutoring. And we refer children to Head Start. We're able to do that because they sign a release. When they become part of our pro program, they sign a release to be part of a research project and also to allow us to refer them to these other agencies. Otherwise, of course, we would have privacy issues and we couldn't do it. But um, it's, really, it's really neat because the positions are actually becoming very much like caseworkers. They follow each family and each child and refer them to all the needs uh, in the community that, or all the programs in the community that might feed their, uh, meet their needs. We expose them to ECRR repeatedly. And just, it looks like we're over time. I, there's a lot of other things I'd like to tell you, but I'll quit. Uh, that, that's okay, Tanya. We do have a few more minutes. We go um, a little, little after two. So if there's something you wanted to wrap up with, that would be just fine. Okay. I, I do have a couple of comments. First of all, uh, when we first started the Play and Learn classes, we, the Hmong Outreach Specialist observed that the parent engagement compared to our other classes was really low and that she needed to try to show the parents what, what parent engagement looked like. So there's a, quite a bit of modeling that happens there. Um, a lot of the parents were not familiar with singing and when she would practice singing, even, even in the play and learn class, they would look a little dumbstruck at her, like they were not comfortable and did not understand what she was doing. And engaging the, the, the whole audience in singing was, was something a little bit different. Um, also, when she would start to do a story time, when she would start to read to them towards the, uh, either in the beginning of the class or at the end of the class, she noticed that the children had a hard time listening because they were not used to being read to. And as the class developed, uh, the children started to be much more engaged in the reading, and she was able to make more uh, to tell more complicated stories, and she discovered that the children were driving the parents or encouraging the parents to come back. So the kids were having so much fun and developing so much that they would be asking if they were going to be going to the library for, for to see their teacher. And I guess I just wanted to leave, leave on this one note. Um, it's a research, uh, it, it came out of the Stanford Social Initiative Review. It's a research project called Collective Impact. Um, it's talked about quite a bit. Um, it just is a, a reminder that we have to get out of our, our silos. For example, the public school system has a silo. The library has a silo. Head Start has a silo. We all have these silos. And if we can come out of those silos and collaborate with partners who make a difference, um, we can have a much bigger impact. And I guess I just want to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. And that is just such a powerful message. Um, as you said on your slide there, collectively we can tackle what no single organization, however innovative or powerful, could accomplish alone. And I think whether you are listening to Tanya's presentation and thinking, whoa, that doesn't going to apply to our community or we can't do that kind of research, there are still elements of this that, that do apply, whether it's just, as Monica said, getting in touch with one other organization who they're the ones who are making the phone calls and they're the ones who are helping promote the library um, or just simply an awareness by having um, your brochures or materials or as Ashley mentioned that word of mouth of just getting the people who are attending to encourage other people to come. Um, those are all really affirming all the way around both to the people who are joining you as well as to the people who um, who haven't yet come and it also is affirming the good work that you're doing at your library. So as we conclude today, I just want to thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. As a panel, I think we saw a lot of different ways of responding to community needs and adjusting our programming to other, whether it's student, student age groups or different cultural backgrounds or different um, times and places to meet up with the library. There are a lot of different ways that we can, we can adapt. Um, as I mentioned, uh, today's webinar will be archived shortly and posted on um, the website. I'll give you that link in just a minute. But if you want any other updates related to early literacy, in particular the Growing Wisconsin Readers Initiative, please just follow us on the blog. There are lots of great ideas and certainly a lot of stories um, from the field that are being shared on the blog this fall. So be sure to check that out. Lastly, uh, the fall webinar series continues. Today was uh, session two of six. There are four more coming up, two in November and two in December. 
They will all take place uh, same same URL, same time. Um, and so we usually go from about 1 to 2.15, depending on what kind of questions we have. Um, but I hope that you will join us in November for Partnership Spotlight. And this is where we, will, where we will be looking specifically at Rock County, Wisconsin. That's in the Arrowhead Library System to look at very specific things they've done there with a variety of community partners. And a librarian and the community partners will be on the panel for that. So again, I want to thank our panelists. They did a wonderful job. Monica and Ashley and Tanya and Christy, thank you so much for giving your time and putting together some great slides that give people a whole bunch of ideas of what they might consider for their library and their community. So with that, we'll stay on the line if there are any other questions or comments from our guests. But the recording will conclude now, and we hope to see you again soon. Thanks.